Starting in Abu Dhabi, where ministers from around the globe are gathered for the latest World Trade Organization meeting. Now, the Director General Ngozi Nkonyo Iwela is now speaking at the moment, as you can see, as she kicks off the official proceedings. It's a four day gathering of trade ministers and officials. She's announced various things, including the launch of a $50 million fund designed to help female entrepreneurs in developing countries. She also says the money is there to enable women to take advantage of the vast opportunities of global trade. Easier said than done, though. That trade is currently facing a great deal of pressure against a backdrop of war and growing economic divisions, not least between the US and China, who are already in a, something of a war of words. The US is accusing China of closed trade practices. China is countering, calling out hegemonic US behavior. Our Middle East business correspondent Samir Hashmi is at the WTO meeting for us in Abu Dhabi and told us what we can expect. Uh, you mentioned tension between US and China. I think that's going to be one of the issues inside that room or that's going to play out over the next four days. But this meeting also comes against the backdrop of geopolitical tension, whether it's the Ukraine war or the war here in the Middle East between Israel and Gaza, which has led to the Houthis striking ships on the Red Sea that has disrupted maritime trade. Uh, the other issues, Sally, that would be discussed, key issues that have been in discussion for a while where the negotiators are hoping that they'll be able to make some breakthrough is on uh, subsidies, on fisheries, agriculture, and also when it comes to e-commerce, cross-border training, because there's a moratorium uh, in place which restricts putting any subsidies on that. But these are contentious issues because there are a lot of division, there's no consensus. And the, the, the thing with the WTO is that no rule can be passed without a consensus, which essentially means that even if one country votes against the resolution, it can't be passed. So that's another challenge. The other thing that's going to come up is the reforms of WTO. There has been this huge push for the last few years that WTO needs to reform itself, especially uh, the trade dispute settlement mechanism, which essentially means that countries, if they have an issue against another country in terms of trade disruption, they can go to... Uh, this uh, this tribunal, but that has been ineffective because the U.S. has been blocking that, especially during the time of Donald Trump when he was president. And there are concerns that if he is back as president later this year after U.S. elections, then that could stall those reforms again. So these are some of the key themes that are going to play out, Sally, over the next four days. Let's see if there will be any breakthrough or not. We'll be right here to follow uh, what's happening at the WTO. He will indeed. Samir Hashmi, who's there for us. Well, I talked to independent trade economist Dr. Rebecca Harding. She said hopes were not high for these talks. The low expectations of what possibly can be achieved will dominate. We're starting this conference from a very weak position, which is actually the position of disagreement rather than the position of agreement. Everybody sort of laid out their stall before we've got here. Um, and what that means is, of course, that everybody is looking to posture a little bit. And I think because there are so many technical issues on the agenda, for example, as your correspondent said, um, issues around dispute settlements, issues around and, um, issues around fisheries and agriculture and e-commerce. It means that there's going to be a lot of wood around that we um, and a lot of trees around, if you like, and we might lose the picture of the whole wood. In terms of the current concern about trade being impacted by the war in Gaza, and of course, the Panama Canal, we had that, uh, we looked at that last week here on this programme, the issues with regards to shipping, to what extent will that be tackled uh, at this conference and, and what can the WTO do about any of this? So the WTO was set up in the 90s to, to be that place where um, trade negotiations, trade conversations and, and the importance of world trade could be could be um, could be promoted. And the problem that we now have is that there are so many disagreements. We've got this backdrop of war and conflict um, and the supply chain issues are really important because What's happening is we're beginning to see negotiations outside of the World Trade Organization happen. All the 
trade negotiations that are going on actually have supply chain resilience, critical supply chain security in them. If you look at US EU or you look at uh, the Atlantic Declaration between the US and the UK, they're all about supply chain resilience. They're not about free trade anymore. And this is what this is what the WTO needs to capture. This is a ground that the WTO needs to come back and say, look, we're actually better off if we all trade ni and play nicely with each other. Also, of course, as Samir mentioned, uh, the outcome of the US election at the end of this year is going to be discussed, surely, because of the potential of another uh, presidency uh, under Donald Trump and what that means for global trade, particularly the US relationship with China. Yeah, and this is one of the big elephants in the room, isn't it? It's it's really difficult because um, because Donald Trump actually was, was the person that started off as a you know, the, the, the fragmentation, if you like, of the World Trade Organization itself um, by by challenging this dispute resolution system. And and until that system is is readdressed, the the World Trade Organization is actually very limited in terms of its overall powers. And as we move closer to the US election, more dialogue about um about reforming that is very, very difficult anything in terms of China, the China is always an issue in US elections. And so as we come closer and closer to the election, that tension between the two countries is likely to build up. The one area where there is something that might happen that's that's positive is around discussions around sustainability, where the US and China actually have to work quite closely together. Dr. Rebecca Harding there, and needless to say, we will keep across the WTO meeting as this week progresses. Now, one of the major areas of conversation at trade talks is, of course, environmental sustainability in the face of carbon reduction targets. In the UK, a leading trade body that represents the oil and gas industry, Offshore Energies UK, has set out a plan for the UK to reach net zero by 2050, and it's calling for a homegrown energy transition, including continuing to offer new oil and gas production licenses alongside the development of things like carbon capture technology and scaling up offshore wind farms. I talked to David Whitehouse, who's chief executive of Offshore Energies UK, to ask to find out more about what's in his report. What we're trying to map out is with a cost of living crisis in the UK, I think, as you quite rightly said, with a, with a budget coming up and actually an election ahead of us, what we're trying to lay out is the great opportunity we have here in the UK, that actually the way we can we transform the way we power the country, that opens up the opportunity for sustained economic growth, gives us the opportunity to create great jobs up and down the country, build on our exist existing supply chain, and do all of that while delivering on our on our climate goals. It's a great opportunity. And what we map out in this manifesto and this report is a very clear pathway of how we deliver that and deliver that by building on our industrial heritage. We are so lucky here in the UK. We've got a fantastic oil and gas sector. We've got the second largest wind farm uh, capability in the world. 200,000 brilliant people working up and down the country. We need to unleash that. Well, let's talk about that because expansion of oil and gas fields offshore um, is is extremely controversial. Is is Labour on board with expansion, or are they just talking about allowing existing offshore drilling to to continue till completion? Let's be clear: what, what we're not talking about is expansion of oil and gas. The the, the North Sea has powered our economy for the last uh, last fifty years, but it's very clear this is a, a declining basin. So, so oil and gas volumes that we produce here in the UK are going to decline. Uh, today, our country, we need 75% of our energy comes from oil and gas, and we produce about half of that. There isn't a scenario where we're going to grow our oil and gas production. But what we call for is a really managed transition. While we still use oil and gas, surely it makes sense that we use our own homegrown energy. And if we do that, we support the people, those important supply chain companies that actually not only will help us with our oil and gas, but will pivot to develop our world-class capability in carbon storage, in wind, particularly floating wind, and also hydrogen. David Whitehouse there, CEO of Offshore Energies UK. Well, let's stay on this subject, but focus on Africa now, where developing a clean energy infrastructure is critical. Despite contributing just 3% of global CO2 emissions, Africa is experiencing serious climate problems, according to the International Energy Agency. 
and its largest purely renewable energy company is one called Infinity Power. It is hoping to make a big difference. I talked to its chairman, Mohammed Mansour. We currently have 1.3 gigawatts in operation uh, across three countries, Egypt, Senegal and South Africa. We uh, produce uh, 4,400 4, gigawatt hours a year, uh, you know, powering uh, almost 2 million homes. Uh, the biggest challenge we see in Africa is basically the bankability of the projects on the continent and uh, the grid capacity to be able to evacuate uh, the energy into the grids. In Senegal, we have just seen them delay significantly by nine months uh, their general election. Now, this is a real concern about the impact it will have on democracy there, where it's seen as a bastion of stability. You operate in Senegal. Uh, your thoughts on that? It's, it's not a good thing, in my opinion. I think, uh, you know, governments should stick to the dates uh, of elections. But then again, uh, you know, the details behind that I'm not uh, fully aware of. So the reasons behind that I, I cannot comment on. Also got elections in South Africa, another country that you say you operate in quite significantly. In South Africa, many, many people are suffering with power outages on a daily basis. It's a real headache for households and for businesses. At Infinity Power, how do you counter that? I mean, it's been a struggle for us for the past uh, maybe two, three years in South Africa. Uh, certain renewable uh, energy uh, purchase programs, I mean, round six, round five and round six have been put in place that were not really successful. And uh, I mean, we're in this for the long haul and, and we believe in South Africa. Uh, so hopefully the next round of uh, purchasing for power from renewables uh, will mitigate the mistakes made in the past. But we both hope. these examples of South Africa and Senegal illustrate how important government is, of course, when it comes to energy policy and how how you as a company can operate within. Yeah, I mean, we, we operate under the certain countries' frameworks. Uh, you know, it's been relatively easy in Egypt for us because the programs have been set and the targets set. And, you know, thankfully, we met these targets along with others. Uh, Senegal has been, uh, you know, pretty straightforward in our opinion. and. You know, we generate around, on days, on good days of wind, we generate around 15% of the country's uh, power. Uh, and, you know, the government and, and the utility there has been pretty easy to deal with uh, in generate, you know, in pre developing more projects there. South Africa, because of the different uh, moving parts, so to speak, you have the IPP office, you have ESCOM, you have uh, Dimeri. Uh, so it's a bit more difficult to manage, I think, in South Africa. And, you know, the government has a lot on its plate to be able to, to make things work. Interesting to get his take. Chairman of Infinity Power, uh, Mohamed Mansour there. Of course, South Africa has got elections soon. Around the world and across the UK, this is BBC News.